Well, I'm Edwin Ellis. I'm a professor at the University of Alabama, and I'm the author of the Make Sense Strategies Toolkit. And in this series of videos, we're going to be looking at the Common Core Standards, grades 6 through 8, as they apply to language arts. And this will be a series of four videos. Uh, in the first one, we're going to be looking at the reading standards and how the Make Sense Strategies can be used to address some of those. Then we're going to be looking at the vocabulary standards, then writing, and finally some of the project-based learning related standards. And so in this video, we're going to be focusing on the reading standards. And so what I'm going to do is, first of all, just provide an overview of what those reading standards are all about. And then we're going to go through and look at examples of how teachers have used uh, the various uh, smart sheets from Make Sense to address some of those standards and, and a variety of different examples. So the Common Core Language Arts Standards for Reading Literature has three major categories, key ideas and details, craft and structure, and integration of knowledge and ideas. Now each one of these major categories has a series of strands or, of standards within, within them. For an example, uh, being able to differentiate between explicit text versus inferences, determining the theme or central idea of the literature, how a plot unfold, unfolds or is propelled, and craft and structures primarily determining word meanings and the impact of word choice and how text structure contributes to meaning, and point of view, and also under integration of knowledge and ideas, com comparing conveyances of literature and comparing genres. So we're going to take a look to begin with at explicit versus uh, text versus inferences. And so here uh, the standards related to that, and you can see that this first one for sixth grade is cite textual evidence to support analysis of what a text says explicitly as well as inferences. And then grade seven is basically the same standard but multiple pieces of evidence. And then for grade eight, uh, grade eight is the same stuff but also being able to determine what provides the strongest evidence and things of that nature. And so in the Make Sense Strategies uh, Toolkit, there's a variety of things uh, that you can use. And we're going to start with addressing what the text says explicitly. And so in the category of literature, there's a whole series of different topics that you could click on. And these link to specific smart visuals related to that topic. So in terms of what the text says explicitly, we're going to click on Story, Grammar, and Sequence. And that will open this page. Now, there are a variety of smart visuals here that address those. And some of these are very definitely little kid-oriented stuff. But as you move further down and over to the right, they get increasingly uh, more sophisticated. So we're going to click on page two right here. And that will take us to another page of Story Grammar. And since we're starting with uh, grade six, we're going to uh, jump up to something a little more sophisticated. So. We're going to start with this one, and then we're going to look at some others, okay? This first one is you have a story in is about, and it's a basic simple step setup in terms of this happened, and what are the major details associated with what happened, so then this happened, and then major details, and so what. So this is a basically a two events frames, fairly simple and straightforward for addressing what did this, the text actually say explicitly. Here's an example of that as applied to Rose's daughter. And so this happened. Beauty's father had to send her to live in the, with a beast in a castle. And then the details associated with that. And then Beauty learns to love the beast and details associated with that. At the bottom, so what? What's important to understand about this? Beauty rejects society's superficial ideals in order to maintain her relationship with the people she loved. So uh, another area that has uh, that, that you can use for what the text says explicitly is if you click on character analysis. And again, there are a number of these that are more for little kids, but some of these are definitely sixth grade and up. And we're going to look at a few of these. Uh, this is a fairly simple one uh, that deals with character features. So you have these prompts. What did the character look like? How did the character act? What was the character's role in the story and how the character changed? And here's an example of how that might look with Robinson Crusoe. A more advanced version of that is this one. And so you can tell that the prompts are a little more sophisticated now. So appearance, how the character looks, 
self-perception, what does the character think about his or herself, uh, transformations, how does the character change in the story, and so forth. Now here's an example of how that looks if you applied it to Huck Finn. Now I'm going to be moving through these samples fairly quickly, and so you're really not going to have a chance to read all of the various things that teachers or students noted on these. Um, however, if you really want to take the time and study some of these, you can always pause the video and analyze them that way. Um, you'll also have copies of this in your handout that you can sort of study at your leisure. And in addition to that, all of the samples that I'm using in this presentation are also found on the software. And I'll show you where you can find those a little bit later. Um, so we're talking about explicit versus inferences. Um, and we've been looking at a variety of uh, smart visuals. If we click on page two of character analysis, there's another one that you might want to take a look at, and that's called the character cl uh, clear table. So I'm going to open that one up. And so if you look at these prompts, you have a character is important character in the story because ways to describe the character, role in the story, what would be an opposite character or don't confuse this character with, or how the character changed in the story. Another prompt is somebody from today's world, this character is like or not like because, and then down at the bottom, knowledge connections, this character makes you think of because. So here's an example of that in terms of applying it to Scrooge from Christmas Carol. So for an example, the opposite character, don't confuse with, don't confuse Scrooge with Bob Cratchit, who works for Scrooge, he's underpaid, never given days off, and so forth. Uh, another one that you can do is uh, if you click on literary analysis, it will take you to this page and you might want to take a look at this one that deals with poems and lyrics because the prompts here um, uh, can help you teach uh, to the standard. For example, the speaker, who's the speaker uh, in the poem, tone, how does the speaker team seem to feel about the subject of the poem, symbolism, the objects of things represent other stuff is like the speaker comparing things to other to, to what something is like and how and theme what's the message about life here's an example as applied to some uh, music lyrics like wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald now we're going to focus a little bit more on the inferences uh, side of this standard and there's a specific section on in the make sense toolbox that that are designed to specifically target inferences about literature uh, so if you click on that, it will take you to this page, and there are two sets of these. One are forming inferences about a character, and one is forming inferences as, uh, about an event, okay? And so there's a very simple version of this, slightly more sophisticated, and, and then an even more sophisticated. So what I'm going to do is share with you one of these just to give you a sense of how these are set up. So you have a title, character, and a point in the story. Um, describe the character. And then under here, um, there's a prompt that says the author never tells the whole story. You have to use your own background knowledge or experiences to make guesses or draw conclusions about parts of the story not explained by the author. These are called inferences. And so you have down here, describe some things about the character that might be true, but the author didn't tell. And then what we're also going to do is sort of categorize the nature of these inferences. So over here, this is a guess or inferences about something related to the character's past, present, or future. Likewise, this is a, a, a guess or inferences about something related to the character's experiences or inferences about the character's feelings or beliefs or actions. So we're going to describe what those inferences might be, which are things that might be true that the author didn't tell, and then why I think so down below. And here's an example of that as applied to Jack and the Beanstalk. Now you may be thinking, well, well, wait a minute, Jack and the Beanstalk, that's not exactly middle school literature. Well, one of the reasons why uh, I'm sharing this with you is anytime you're using a smart visual that's not uh, going to be familiar to students and you think they're, it's not sort of intuitive in terms of how you use it, it's always a good idea to go through it uh, uh, first time using a story um, that students are already really familiar with. And so the complexity of the story doesn't get in the way of learning how to do the smart visual. And so you might do it on something familiar like Jack and the Beanstalk, such as here, so they can get a sense of how this works and then start applying it to the literature, the middle school literature that they're actually reading. 
Um, in terms of determining the uh, theme or central idea, um, likewise, there are a series of standards that gradually get more sophisticated in relation to that. And so what we're going to do is share a few of the smart visuals that can help you with that. And one of the things you can do is up here under the generic organizer uh, smart sheets, if you look at the, the multiple main ideas, I'm going to click on four main ideas, and that opens this page. And then we're going to take a look at this one. And that provides an example of how you can use sort of a generic four main idea graphic in order to address themes. In this case, uh, what we're looking at are King Arthur stories. And, and basically, there are four themes basically found in all King Arthur stories. Like there's always some kind of challenge. There's always a, a quest, always some kind of enchantment. And it always has a promise required by the chivalry code. Now, what's real important about things like this is students usually don't know enough about themes in order to come up with these various topics. They can't just find and recognize that that's one of the themes. Um, and so the way this works best is you start by identifying what the themes are, and then as you're reading the story with the students and so forth, then you can have the students identify what would be evidence of each of those themes as it occurs in the story. One of the ways you can use this is like with a cooperative learning group. And so one group might be reading a story looking for evidence of this, whereas a different group is looking for evidence of this other theme and so forth. And then after they have collected their evidence, then they share with the whole class what they found for their respective themes. The role, um, your role at this point, becomes sort of a guided note-taking thing where you're modeling how to take notes in very concise and precise ways for each of these themes and making sure that the important stuff's not left out. Uh, if you click on literary analysis, there's also some things there that can help with central idea or theme. And what we're going to do is click on the one that's actually literary themes. And so if you click on that, uh, what I've done here is developed, uh, develop a smart visual that has some of the most common themes in literature already listed. Now, for sure, there are a lot more themes than that, but these are some of the most common ones. And the reason why I've done that is that uh, a, a typical assignment is sort of read the story, try to figure out what the message about life is or the theme, and, and explain it. Well, often kids in middle school don't know enough about themes in order to do that very well. But if you have a list of themes in front of them, and, and you have some understanding or brief explanation of what these themes are, suddenly it gets a whole lot easier to identify the theme in a story. And so examples of those is like the triumph of good over evil, or search for one's destiny, or the price of love, or search for significance, etc. And so these are the most common themes, and there's also a place to put a different theme if, if one's not represented here that students think of. And so the way this is set up is, is you select the theme, and then you identify specific evidence in the story that you think supports your choice for the theme. And these might be quotes or passages um, or other th events in the story. And then out here next to it is you explain why you think that is evidence of the theme. Uh, here's an example of how that's uh, been done with the story across five Aprils. So in this case, the theme is the price of war and peace. And these are different events that happen in the story that uh, students thought supported this notion of the price of war. And this is an explanation of why they thought these events supported choice of that theme. And of course, this can be then used for writing essays uh, about the theme of the story. Um, another area here is how the plot unfolds or is propelled. And these are some of the standards associated with that. And there are a number of tools here that can help you um, with that one. Uh, we're going to click on Story Grammar and Sequence to begin with. Now, you'll notice that a lot of these are really for little kid oriented. And, and then as we move into these, they get increasingly more sophisticated. So I'm going to click on page two. And we're going to uh, start with a four-step sequence just to kind of explain how you might use that one. So in this case, um, what's the story is about and what's a major event in the story at the beginning and details associated with that. And that led to this next major event and its details and so forth. Um, another one is with character analysis and how the characters respond to change. And so if you click on 
feature simple. We, we sh shared this with you a little bit earlier, but this prompt at the bottom sort of addresses that. Likewise, the more sophisticated version of that, Transformations, addresses that. In addition, if you click on page two of character analysis and you looked at how the character changed, that's set up similarly. So you have a character at the beginning of the story, what caused the character to change, and a description of the character at the end of the story. And here's an example of how that would apply to Rip Van Winkle. Uh, some examples of how text structure contributes to meaning. Um, these are the standards uh, that are addressed there. And so there are a variety of tools here. One is if you click on, if you're in Story Grammar and Sequence, and you go to page two there, um, we're going to look at action, rise, and fall. And so basically what you have here is you have uh, the characters in the setting and what's a problem or a goal in the story and uh, how it's introduced. And this are spaces in, that reflects the rising action or how that problem escalated. The climax is the problem at its biggest or the turning point in the story. And then you have the falling action as the story's winding down and then the resolution to the story. Stuff in the middle is what you liked about the story. And so here's an example of how it would apply to Little Red Riding Hood. So again, what we're doing is we're using an example first with kids using a story they're already totally familiar with so they can get a sense of how that works. And then later on, we'll apply it to literature like a, like a chapter from Huck Finn. Um, if you click on Story Problem, there's some tools there uh, that also can address this standard. And uh, this is what's called Book Report 2, and the settings is um, you have a setting, uh, words that describe the setting, and then the context, and that's uh, what was happening in time at the time the story took place, specific characters and information about each of those characters, and then you have a beginning problem that's introduced, and then things that make the problem bigger. And then finally, the climax description of the problem at its worst, and then how the problem was addressed. And then finally, the story ending. Now, typically, these stories end in one of three ways. It presents the last thing that happened uh, uh, to solve the problem, or it shows the problem was never really solved, or explains what happened to the characters after the problem uh, was solved. And so this thing is set up. You have your introduction, and then the problem presentation, and then the ending of the story. Here's an example of that as applied to Cinderella. Uh, another one that's um, more sophisticated uh, is problem analysis, and it reflects um, uh, really drilling down now in terms of how problems tend to be presented in literature. And so you have a basic problem, and then there are various factors that are contributing to this problem to make it worse. And then typically with a problem, there's some kind of goal of what you want to happen. Then you have different ways of solving that problem and the actual problem-solving action that was taken. So anytime you take some kind of action to solve the problem, there are always going to be some results. And some of those results are going to be unexpected, things that wouldn't be predicted. And there might be some expected results as well. But anytime you, you change something and you produce results, it always creates new spin-off problems or tensions. And so those are listed down here. Now, uh, one of the stories that illustrates that really well is a story called Crazy in Alabama by Mark Childress. And so, for an example, the problem, one of the problems in the story is that the blacks wanted a right to swim in the new pool, but the whites want a white-only pool. Factors that are contributing to the problem was the new pool new pool was built in Cornelia, and the local racists recently had killed two blacks for participating in civil rights protests. And the goal is the main character, Pijo, wants to support blacks in their efforts to attain civil rights. In other words, an opportunity for his black friends to swim in the, swim in the pool, but he's living in this sort of white racist society, and he's a white boy. So different ways he could solve the problem. He could have found someone to help him so he wouldn't have to do it himself. The actual problem-solving action he took as he steps up to defend the black boys is they're getting beaten up by the white police outside the pool fence. Well, that created some unexpected spin-offs, like the photographer take Pijo's picture and ends up in Life magazine, and Pijo becomes a small hero in the black community, and his uncle business is boycotted by the whites. 
what was expected is Pijo ostracized by the local white community and becomes a target of hate. Well, that creates all kinds of new spin-off tensions like Martin Luther King Jr. and George Wallace come to Cornelia and the tension escalates and leads to race riots. Pijo's home is burned, federal marshals arrest the local police and so forth. So this basic pattern is a uh, can be used when you're doing problem analysis when you're reading literature. It can be applied to Huck Finn or basically any other piece of literature that's typically read in, in middle school. Uh, another tool that you can use in terms of how text structure contributes to meaning, if we click on literary analysis, um, one of the things that teachers sometimes are expected to do is, is address uh, literary devices. And so these are the more common literary devices that are encountered like what use of an allegory or alliteration or hyperbole or oxymoron, a paradox, and so forth. Now, obviously, kids aren't going to be able to pick these out unless they know what they are. And so this is just a list, but you also have to teach what they are. This is just a smart visual that allows students to then address how those literary devices are being used and what evidence there are. So for an example, in Charlotte's Web, um, the literary devices are irony, satire, anthropomorphism, and the control or lack of over your destiny. And so under anthropomorphism, this would be an example of what happened, and here's explanation or evidence of how that occurred in Charlotte's Web. Irony, um, satire, and control over one's destiny. So what we've done is we've taken each of the, each of the devices, listed it, and then, and then explained uh, where it occurred, and, and then explained why that was a device used. Uh, conveying, uh, comparing conveyances in literature, this one is a pretty much a sticky wicket uh, and gets a little bit complex. If you just look at the standard, for an example, compare and contrast the experiences of reading a story, drama, and a poem to listening or viewing an audio, video, live version of the text, including contrasting what they see and hear when reading the text to what they perceive when they listen or watch. Wow, is that not a convoluted standard or what? Okay. And then it just gets worse. Okay, so one of the things I'm thinking is how are we going to do this and how can we use smart visuals to, to actually make this a doable kind of standard to address. And so what I'm going to do is show you how I would set that up. Um, I'm going to select under compare and contrast, matrix and conclusions. And I'm going to collect, uh, select a three by four conclusions because what we're going to be doing basically is comparing um, a story with a drama and poem and then what we're going to be doing is looking at the audio or listening to it in terms of what you see it here versus a video version or watching it in terms of what you see in here versus watching a play version of it versus reading about it and suddenly now when you set it up that way this whole uh, standard becomes much more doable now, another one is the, the seventh grade version. This gets a little more different because now we're looking at audio, film, stage, or multimedia version, and then analyzing the effects of techniques unique to each medium, like lighting, sound, color, camera fo focus, and angles. So here's how you might set that one up. We're going to do something similar, and uh, we're going to have audio, film, stage, and multimedia, and how the techniques are used in each of those to maximize the medium. Uh, in terms of uh, comparing to the extent at which filmed or live production of a story stays faithful to or, part, or departs from the text. Uh, I'm also going to use compare and contrast for that. And since I'm really just comparing filmed or live version versus faithful to the text, I'm going to pick things that compare two things across six dimensions. And so, for an example, I'm going to compare uh, To Kill a Mockingbird book with the movie. And this one looks at various characters in the story and how they're conveyed in the book versus how they're conveyed in the movie and how they were similar. So this is similarities and differences. Likewise, I can compare significant important events that occurred in the story and how they were conveyed in the book versus how they were compared in the movie. So what I've done here is just uh, hopefully provided you with a sense that there are a lot of tools and that make sense that can help you address these various uh, grade six, eight language arts standards. And there are 
what so what I would encourage you to do is just spend some time with that software just clicking at samples and opening them up and looking at them and just getting a sense of what's on there um, and seeing what you think would be helpful for you when you're teaching these standards in the next video we're going to take a look at some some specific uh, vocabulary smart visuals uh, they're specifically designed for teaching vocabulary and then we're going to look at some literature applications of those that are appropriate for middle school